Oh, uh, hope everyone is uh, logged in, ready to go. Again, I am Andrew Whittle, conservation educator with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Uh, my area that I cover is in northern Kentucky, uh, Boone, Kenton, Carroll, Henry, Tremble, Owen counties. If any of my students are out there right now, I hope you're going to leave some good comments for me. We're definitely going to be uh, wanting your questions, but I need some interaction today as well from you. I'm going to be asking you questions and you're going to have to write in some answers. But I also want to introduce my helper over here. He can introduce himself. Hi everybody, my name is Josh Horton. I'm a seasonal educator here at Salado, and I'll be handling some props and answering uh, or asking him some questions for you guys. All right. The topic today is wildlife adaptations. These are the things animals use to help them survive in the wild. Let's get started. Have you ever wondered how animals survive in the wild? And just take these white-tailed deer. They're out in freezing temperatures, very little shelter, very little food. They've got to do this every winter. Luckily, they have certain adaptations that help them to survive situations like these. You know, think about the way you dress in the winter time, and also the way you don't dress. Uh, hopefully you're not wearing shorts and a bathing suit out in the winter time. Hopefully you're putting on things like these. Uh, when it's cold, you put on a coat. You put on a hat when it's cold. I don't have one of those. And you put on gloves when it's cold. Here's my gloves. These will help me survive uh, in the winter. You know, when you do this, you are adapting to your environment similar to a way an animal might adapt to its environment or adjust to changes in its environment. I'm going to adjust back to my environment and take off my winter stuff here so it's not that cold in here. I always like to start my students with a couple definitions. I know boring, but we got to get through them. Uh, so when I say adaptation, here's what I mean. An adaptation is anything that helps an organism survive in its environment. It can also refer to how an animal can adjust to changes in its environment. And there are two different types of adaptations. There are the physical adaptations and the behavioral adaptations. Physical adaptations, these are really the things on the outside of animals helping them to survive. Behavioral adaptations are more how an animal acts, how they behave helping them to survive. And today we're really going to focus on the physical adaptations. If we have some time at the end, we might get into some of the behavioral stuff. Uh, and there are different types of physical adaptations. Uh, physical adaptations are body structures. Uh, it might help an animal find and consume food, defend itself, reproduce. Or these physical adaptations are helping animals survive in its environment. Take a look at the insect in the picture. Uh, that insect is called a walking stick, and it looks exactly like a stick. You might think, well, how does looking like a stick help you survive? Well, that walking stick lives and eats vegetation. They're on plants. Uh, so if you look like what you live on, your predators are going to have a hard time spotting you. Uh, so first type of physical adaptation we're going to dis discuss today is camouflage. Uh, camouflage is the use of color helping you blend in with your surroundings. The hunters out there know when you go hunting, you wear camouflage to help you blend in with the background so the animals you're hunting can't spot you. When I say camouflage in classrooms, I think a lot of students end up thinking of chameleons first. Because chameleons are famous for being able to change color uh, to match different backgrounds. But of course, chameleons are not Kentucky animals. So let's get to some Kentucky animals and some of the camouflage they use. First one I want to talk about is a fawn deer. And I've got a fawn pelt with me today. Uh, so check that pelt out. So that fawn is covered with white spots. And you might be thinking, uh, how does being polka dotted help you blend in with anything? Well, a fawn deer, their defense mechanism is to curl up into the fetal position in the tall grass. Uh, and they're going to sit motionless. Those spots mimic rays of sun that are shining through the grass onto the ground. So it helps camouflage that uh, baby deer with the grass. And what's mom doing through all this? She leaves. She's gone. And no, she's not being a bad mom. She's going to try to draw any predators to follow her. 
away from the fawn that's hiding in the tall grass. So here's a prey animal, something that's eaten by other things, using its camouflage uh, to hide from predators. Well, guess what? The predators, they're in the game as well. The predators, they're using camouflage as well. Take this predator. This is a bobcat. Uh, we brought a bobcat pelt in with us today. So here's a predator using its camouflage uh, to blend in so it can better sneak up on its prey. Now bobcats, adult bobcat, we're talking uh, maybe 30 pounds, you know, size of a really big house cat or small dog. They live all across Kentucky, uh, except really maybe in big urban centers. Uh, but you can see from the picture up there uh, how well they camouflage, and especially in habitats like that field. You know, they're eating things like rabbits, which their adaptation, they're really fast. Uh, so this bobcat uh, uses its camouflage to get close to that rabbit before it can see it. It's an ambush hunter. I've heard you, we're going to learn a lot more about bobcats in a couple days. That might be one of our programs coming up. Uh, let's get to another predator, uh, a different type, a bird predator. So next critter up is the eastern screech owl. Now, if you watched yesterday, uh, you got to see a real eastern screech owl. Uh, but the picture up here on the screen, this is showing it in its habitat. Uh, they talked about how the feathers on the eastern screech owl help them blend in with their surroundings, so match that tree bark uh, really perfectly. Uh, and they're also really small, like you saw yesterday when you saw the real eastern screech owl. That helps them hide. So they're hiding during the daytime, uh, so other predators don't eat them. Uh, and then at nighttime, uh, they're hunting insects, small mammals, things like that. Now yesterday, I think there was a question, uh, what does an eastern screech owl sound like? And I've got the sound for you. Uh, so I'm gonna play this sound. And like we said yesterday, it doesn't really sound much like a screech. So here we go. So if you've ever heard that on a summer evening, wondered what in the world did I just hear, maybe now you can better identify it as an eastern screech owl. I think it's maybe a good spot to stop and see if we've got any questions. We do have a few in. questions. Okay. Um, first question is from Sawyer, age 10. What is a good adaptation for summertime? What are some adaptations that are good for the heat? Yeah. Uh, so white-tailed deer change color. Uh, maybe, you might, maybe people didn't know that. Uh, so in the wintertime, their coat gets thicker, um, a more duller color. Springtime comes, summertime, more colors out there. Their coat is going to get thinner and be a brighter reddish brown, look prettier coat as well. Okay, one more question here from James. Um, going back to the fawns, when are they typically born? What season? Uh, so those fawns are born in the spring. Uh, May, June is when they're uh, going to be born. That's when they're going to be laying in the tall grass. They'll start following mom around a little bit more a couple months later. Uh, they can get up and walk within the first couple hours of being uh, born, uh, but they can't outrun a predator. So they're hanging out in that tall grass. Mom comes back and checks on them a couple times a day to, to feed them mother's milk uh, and, and, and check on them as well. Any more? Nope, that's it All for now. All right. Well, as I told you, there are many different types of physical adaptations. We've covered camouflage. Let's move on to the second type we're going to talk about today. And our second type is mimicry. Mimicry is looking or sounding like another organism. You know, take the two butterflies that just popped up onto the screen. They're both big orange butterflies, but one of them is toxic, one of them is not toxic. And this is where I need some audience interaction. Anyone out there, can you tell me which butterfly is which? One is a monarch, one is a viceroy. So if you can write in, I'll give you just a couple seconds, see who can get the correct answer. Which one's the toxic, which one's the not toxic butterfly? Any answers rolling in? None yet, okay. not at the moment. Well, maybe you're 
Uh, computer fingers are as slow as mine, but you better get them going because I'm going to have a quiz coming up here next. So here's the answer to this question. The toxic butterfly is the monarch. The not toxic butterfly is the viceroy. Now monarchs are toxic uh, because the caterpillars feed on milkweed, picks up the toxin there. Uh, when a bird eats a monarch, well, it tastes terrible. It makes them sick because of that toxin. The bird learns a lesson. What's the lesson? Well, the lesson is I don't like eating big orange butterflies. Well, the viceroy is also a big orange butterfly. Uh, it's not toxic, uh, but birds avoid them because they mimic, they look like the toxic monarch. And birds can't tell the difference between the two butterflies, but us people can. Uh, the secret, well, the best one I like to use, uh, there's a bar going across the bottom two wings of the viceroy. The monarch lacks that bar. Another good thing about the viceroy that I can't miss out telling you, this is a Kentucky proud animal. The viceroy it is our Kentucky state butterfly. So if you've ever seen the Kentucky license plates with big orange butterflies on them, maybe you thought those were monarchs on the plates. They're not, they're viceroys. Next time you see one, look for the bar on the bottom two wings, proving to you it's a viceroy. All right, well, I've got a mimicry quiz for you guys, and this is why I really need you to write in your answers. Uh, so on my quiz, I want you to try to figure out what these animals are trying to disguise themselves as. And the first one I want you to take a look at is this caterpillar. This caterpillar belongs to the giant swallowtail butterfly, so uh, eventually forms a uh, chrysalis emerges as an adult butterfly. But any, can anyone out there guess what it is trying to mimic as a caterpillar? And if I can give you some clues, I usually say in my class, uh, I'll get things like fungus or a dead leaf. Uh, you have a, need to have a little better potty humor maybe to get this one right. Are we getting any answers? None Rolling yet. In? No answers yet. I'll give you a couple more seconds before I give you this answer, see if any answers pop up. Or maybe I just might have to give you the first one before you get warmed up. All right, the answer to the first one in the mimicry quiz, that giant swallowtail butterfly caterpillar is trying to mimic bird droppings. Why? Well, what a perfect thing to mimic if your predators are birds. Because what is something a bird would never eat? its own droppings. All right, next up. This one should be a little bit easier. We talked about this animal already. Number two is going to be the walking stick. Uh, this insect, any answers coming through there? Not yet. Uh, this insect, like I said, we already mentioned it, it is trying to mimic a stick. It lives on vegetation. If you look like your habitat, if you mimic your habitat, your predators may miss you, maybe avoid you. Next up, number three on the quiz. This is a species of fly. It doesn't look like the common house fly, that's for sure. Uh, anybody guess what that's meaning? If you're not writing in, hopefully you're guessing uh, with whoever you're watching with. So hopefully you'll get the right answer. So this fly is trying to mimic a bee. Bees have stingers. Uh, animals learn the lesson, just like we learn the lesson. If you get stung, it's painful. That fly, no stinger, completely harmless. But if you look like something that is more dangerous than you are, you tend to get avoided. All right, next on, this is definitely an easy one. Uh, we just mentioned this one. That's the Viceroy, the Kentucky State Butterfly. You can see the bars on the bottom two wings. It is mimicking the Monarch Butterfly. Again, monarchs are toxic, viceroys are not. So if you, again, you look like something that is more dangerous than you really are, you tend to get avoided. Last one on the quiz, uh, usually the hardest one in the classrooms, is the snake in the bottom corner. There. Now we've, are, we've had some lessons on snakes already. Now that is the Scarlet King snake. It is a Kentucky native snake. It is non-venomous. I'd be really impressed if someone out there can uh, tell me what this is trying to mimic. And uh, no, it is not sticks or paint or anything like that. I hear that in the classroom. Uh, the answer, nobody's writing in fast enough. 
Jackson oh. Elkins, age 10, guessed a coral snake. Oh, Jackson, good job, good job, well done. Uh, it is mimicking the coral snake. You must have been watching uh, on previous days, or maybe you're just smart enough to know it. Yeah, the coral snake is a venomous snake, and if you've been watching, you know this is not a Kentucky native snake, so we do not have the venomous coral snake. So if you see a snake with red, yellow, and white striping on it, and uh, black, uh, you know that is not the venomous coral snake. It's going to be real easy to identify here, but in many places uh, they have both species. So there is a rhyme. We also learned this rhyme again yesterday. The rhyme is red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, friend of Jack. Now, I like my little video here. Maybe uh, it describes it a little better. So where red touches yellow, kill a fellow, that's the coral snake. Where red touches black, friend of Jack, that is the non-venomous Scarlet King. Okay. Uh, some more mimics. Uh, check out, uh, insects tend to do a lot of this mimicry. So this is a really beautiful, next one up here is a polyphemus moth. Has some really interesting color and patterns on their wings. Uh, hopefully you're guessing at home what those patterns look like. Uh, their eyes, uh, it's covered with eyes, even the wing tips kind of look like eyes. Now if a predator comes up to this moth and sees those big eyes, the predator might think, oh, what big eyes you have. Now, of course, we know there are eye spots on the wings, but the predator does not. So those eye spots make the moth look much bigger than it really is. Uh, the predator may not want to take down such a big prey. Uh, another moth with some eye spots. Uh, guess with your family, what does that look like to you? And if I could give you any guesses, uh, you just had a long lecture about raptors yesterday. Uh, I think this moth looks a lot like a great horned owl. Check out uh, how perfect those eye spots mimic the eye spots on the great horned owl. But of course that begs the question, you know, how does that coloration how does looking like an owl uh, protect you? Well, owls are top predators in many woodland habitats. If you look like the biggest, baddest guy on the block, well, nobody's going to mess with you. So this, again, this moth is trying to look bigger, meaner, scarier than it really is. Last one of these mimics, it's another caterpillar. This is the caterpillar of the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Uh, looks really cool. Uh, so this is, uh, will eventually become this beautiful spice bush swallowtail adult butterfly, but as a caterpillar, I get lots of guesses on these, I think it's trying to mimic a snake. Looks like a snake to me. Uh, and it is a great mimic. Uh, these are not the caterpillar's eyes. Uh, here's its head, so head and mouth part is all down here. So it's all a bluff, all mimicry. I think probably another good spot for us to see if we have any questions. We do have a couple questions. Uh, first question is from Beth, who wants to know, do monarchs migrate? Great question, Beth. Uh, they have actually a really interesting migration. So all those monarchs you see here in Kentucky in the summertime, they don't spend the winter here. They leave, and with the most, uh, pretty much all the butterflies, monarch butterflies in the eastern U.S., they all migrate to a single forest in Mexico, and they will overwinter in Mexico. Uh, and then they'll start their return migration, and they'll breed, die, uh, give young multiple times before getting back to Kentucky. So the really cool thing about this migration is that no one butterfly starts and finishes the migration. How do they know how to get back to the same uh, forest in Mexico every year? How do they know how to get back to Kentucky having never been here before? Maybe it's a behavioral adaptation, like an instinct. It's a good way we would say that. Any more questions popping up? One more question. Luke, age 10, wants to know, what adaptation would you like personally? <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you might be in a awkward situation where some mimicry could help you out. So, um, you know, looking, looking different than what you look like, maybe you can sneak in on where people are trying to talk behind your back or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Uh, so we've gone through two different types of physical adaptations. We've talked camouflage, we've talked mimicry. The next one up is called chemical defenses. Now these are things like venom, ink, and sprays. Uh, you know, we talk venomous snakes and some of the other talks. So venom is, is definitely a defense there and helps them uh, uh, kill and consume their prey. I think we all know about skunk stinky spray. We've already had some talks about skunks. I'll talk a little bit more about them. Uh, what about an octopus? Anybody know what they spray? Uh, well, they spray ink into the water. So if a predator like a shark's around, they shoot this jet of black ink into the water, darkens the water, confuses that shark, uh, gives the octopus time to get away. Of course, no octopus in Kentucky, so we're going to have to learn more about skunks. And I've got a skunk pelt in with me today, and we've already myth busted some skunks if you watched our wildlife myths. Uh, so uh, skunks will usually give you a warning before they spray. This eastern stri striped skunk, the warning is tail up. If you get that warning, heed the warning, hopefully you won't get sprayed. Uh, but if you do get sprayed, uh, it, that stinky spray is a liquid that comes from a gland underneath their tail. Uh, they can spray that liquid up to 10 feet, excellent aim, always aiming for their target's face, like the dog there in the picture. Uh, it's, that liquid's going to get into their eyes. It's going to tempor temporarily blind them. It's going to burn. Uh, it's going to smell terrible, get in their mouth and taste terrible and burn. And you can see in the picture that dog's eating a bath in tomato paste. Well, we busted that myth already. Uh, there's a better method to use. I think the combination of chemicals is hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and detergent. Works much better than that tomato paste. And our fourth and final physical adaptation, uh, these are body coverings and parts, really the things on the outside of an animal helping them survive. Examples include things like claws, beaks, feet, armor plates, skulls, teeth. You know, I think armor plates, first thing I tend to think of uh, are turtles. And we've got a turtle shell. I know we've learned reptiles already. Uh, so this is a common snapping turtle shell. If you find a snapping turtle near you, you're most likely finding a common snapping turtle. A lot of my students will say, that's an alligator snapping turtle. Now, if you're in far western Kentucky walking, uh, watching right now, uh, maybe it's an alligator snapper. Uh, most of us, it's a common snapper. This hard outer shell, I'm going to give it a knock here, uh, definitely provides protection for the turtle inside. Uh, hooves uh, are body coverings and parts. And we've brought in some hooves with us today. Uh, the big one belongs to an elk, the smaller a white-tailed deer. Now, these hooves are adapted for speed. If you were to ever look at fossils of members of the deer family from thousands of years ago, they have more toes touching the ground than they do today. Believe it or not, one way to get fast is reduce the number of toes that hit the ground. So how many are hitting the ground now? Uh, we saw two hooves, and those hooves are made of keratin which is some of the same stuff that's in your fingernails. Uh, so reduce the number of toes, increase your speed. So as deer, members of the deer family got bigger and faster, they needed to outrun their predators. Let me give you another example. Uh, think about a horse. How many toes hit the ground on a horse? Tick, tick, tick. Uh, the answer is one. One horseshoe. Think how fast horses are. We race them in Kentucky. They're so fast. So reduce the toes, you get fast. These are adaptations to outrun their predators. Uh, here's some more body coverings and parts. Uh, another foot. Now this one belongs to a predator trying to use their foot to catch prey. This foot belongs to a bald eagle. We checked it out yesterday as well. Uh, there are four curved claws on this talon. If you remember from yesterday, we said bald eagles eat mainly fish. So I like to describe those curved talons as fish hooks. When a bald eagle goes fishing, it's using eight hooks, right? Four on each foot. Uh, it doesn't like to miss when it goes fishing. The bottom of that foot, hopefully we got a good shot uh, of the bottom of that foot. It's covered in bumps. Uh, that's for grip. If you're a basketball player, if you've ever held a basketball, you know they are covered in bumps. That's for your grip when you play. Helps you catch a quick pass, control the ball when you dribble. 
Uh, those bumps are for grip for the bald eagle. Help them hold on to slippery, slimy things like a fish. Uh, no, uh, here's some talons in action. Like we just got done talking, definitely talking these birds yesterday. There's the bald eagle with a fish, red tail hawk with a snake, uh, barn owl with a rodent. And another bird. This bird is a great blue heron. This is also a bird that eats fish, just like a bald eagle. But it has different physical adaptations, different body coverings and parts that help this great blue heron uh, catch fish. So some of their adaptations include a long neck. Uh, this helps them get fish that are deep under the water. They have long featherless legs, help them wade through the shallows. This is not a bird that is sitting on the water like a duck or a goose. It's walking through the shallows with those long featherless legs. And a long spear-like beak to help them spear fish. So they're moving very slowly through the shallows. When they get close to a fish, they kind of coil that neck back like a snake ready to strike. Uh, plunge that spear into the water, and if successful, they spear a fish. Good place to stop for some questions. Any questions rolling in now? We've got a couple more questions here. Uh, Luke, age eight, wants to know, how big do skunks usually get after looking at that? Skin? Yeah. Uh, so Eastern Strike skunk, we're talking the size of a house cat. Um, so a couple pounds, eight, nine, 10 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and James from Frankfurt wants to know, where can you find great blue heron? Good question, James. Uh, this is a common Kentucky bird. You can find great blue heron uh, pretty much anywhere where you can find bodies of water that have fish in them, their food. So uh, next time you go fishing uh, or a farm, pond, lake, stream, uh, this might be one of the birds that you see. Okay. Uh, so we are going to talk a little bit about behavioral adaptation. So if you remember at the beginning, I told you there were two different types. Physical adaptations, we covered them well. Camouflage, mimicry, chemical defenses, body coverings and parts. We're just going to dip our toes into these behavioral adaptations. So behavioral adaptations uh, are behaviors, things animals are doing to help them survive. Examples include things like social behavior. Think of animals that live in big herds, grouping together for protection. Uh, behaviors like a possum playing dead. Now we talked possum when we talked wildlife myths. Shouldn't say playing dead. They're not playing or acting anything when they do this. They have passed out due to stress. And uh, I like to learn from cartoons sometimes. So I've got a what I think is a funny wildlife cartoon. Uh, animals have amazing instincts. Uh, check the beaver. Uh, the beaver's thinking, uh, you know, my instinct, I must build a dam. The duck, winter's approaching, I must fly south soon. The sea turtle just hatched, it's thinking I'm alive, I need to find the ocean. And what is your pet dog thinking? Uh, the pet dog is thinking I must barf and then eat that barf. Uh, now why do dogs do that? I don't know, they just tend to do it. Uh, so there are two different types of behavioral adaptations as well. There are the instinctive behaviors. Uh, these are things that happen naturally, don't have to uh, learn these things. Uh, remember we mentioned monarch butterflies using instincts uh, to help them migrate. And the other type is called a learned behavior. These are behaviors that must be taught. Uh, I like to use the example of uh, math in school. Uh, you know, when you were born, the day you were born, you didn't know two plus two equaled four. Hopefully all you school kids, you've been out of school for a while, hopefully you haven't forgotten this, uh, but you now know from years of learning that two plus two does indeed equal four, and uh, animals use this uh, type of learning behavior as well. Any final questions rolling in for me? Uh, yeah, there's uh, one question from Nathan, age 11, who wants to go back to mimicry. Mm -hmm. Why do alligator snapping turtles mimic a worm while hunting fish? Right. Great question, great question. So uh, they sit very still at the bottom of, bo bottom of body of water that they're in. They open up their mouth nice and wide uh, and their tongue, they wiggle it around. It looks like a worm. Uh, 
Uh, if you've ever been fishing before, perhaps you've used a worm on a hook before, uh, wheels around that vibration, uh, attracts a fish, the fish will swim right into that alligator snapper's, snapper's mouth, uh, chomping down, getting an easy meal. Okay. Uh, anything more? Nope, that's no, it no. for now. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in with us today. Uh, please come back tomorrow. We'll have another great topic uh, about wildlife. 1 p.m. here at the Salado Center on their Facebook page. Tune in.